The Publishing Ministry, Chapter 17 Establishing Publishing Houses in New Locations Plants in Many Places Throughout the World He, the Lord, has declared that His means should be proportionately distributed, that the cities not only of America, but of all the world, might hear the message of warning. If plants had been made in many places, if the cities had been worked as God designed they should be, thousands of men and women would have been converted to the truth. Publishing Houses as Outpost Centers Repeatedly, the Lord has instructed us that we are to work the cities from outpost centers. In these cities, we are to have houses of worship as memorials for God, but institutions for the publication of our literature, for the healing of the sick, and for the training of workers are to be established outside the cities. Especially is it important that our youth be shielded from the temptations of city life. It is in harmony with this instruction that meeting houses have been purchased and rededicated in Washington and in Nashville, while the publishing houses and the sanitariums at these centers have been established away from the congested heart of the cities as outpost centers. This is the plan that has been followed in the removal of other publishing houses and sanitariums into the country, and that is now being followed in Great Britain with regard to the London Publishing House and also the training school there. Moved 20 miles from London to Stanborough Park, Watford, Hertfordshire, England, in 1906. We are now given opportunity to advance in the opening providences of God by helping our brethren in these and many other important centers to establish the work on a firm basis in order that it may be carried forward solidly. No large business firms in the cities. God has sent warning after warning that our schools and publishing houses and sanitariums are to be established out of the city in places where the youth may be taught most effectively what is truth. Let no one attempt to use the testimonies to vindicate the establishment of large business interests in the cities. Do not make of no effect the light that has been given upon this subject. Men will arise speaking perverse things to counterwork the very movements that the Lord is leading His servants to make. But it is time that men and women reasoned from cause to effect. It is too late, too late to establish large business firms in the cities, too late to call young men and women from the country to the city. Conditions are arising in the cities that will make it very hard for those of our faith to remain in them. It would, therefore, be a great mistake to invest money in the establishment of business interests in the cities. Church-operated grade schools and church buildings may, of necessity, be erected in city environments according to the counsel given. Plants near but outside large cities The movements made by many in Battle Creek to counterwork the effort to transfer the publishing house to another place as the Lord directed will reveal their results. It will be seen what it means to work contrary to the purposes of God. But I have been shown that the results of this opposition will not be fully known until the books of heaven shall be opened and every man shall be judged according to the deeds done in the body. Again and again we have seen the results of working directly against the plan of God. We have seen how great a mistake it is for men to use their influence to turn aside the counsel of God in order to bring in human devising. Men have been held in Battle Creek who ought long ago to have been out in the fields that are destitute of workers. Shall I not judge for this thing, saith the Lord? Human wisdom has urged the advantage of remaining in Battle Creek when the Lord had said, Go! Make plants in various places near to but outside the large cities. Not in a city, but in a rural district. As our brethren search for a location for the Review and Herald Publishing House, they are earnestly to seek the Lord. They are to move with great caution, watchfulness, and prayer 
and with a constant sense of their own weakness. We must not depend upon human judgment. We must seek for the wisdom that God gives. In regard to establishing the institution in New York, I must say, be guarded. I am not in favor of its being near New York. I cannot give all my reasons, but I am sure that any place within thirty miles of that city would be too near. Study the surroundings of other places. I am sure that the advantages of Washington, D.C. should be closely investigated. In the year 1903, the Review and Herald Publishing Association was built on a piece of property next to the northern boundary of the District of Columbia, about five to six miles from the U.S. capital. The location was more rural than municipal and ideally adapted for our printing work. The workers connected with the publishing house must be closely guarded. Our young men and young women must not be placed where they will be in danger of being ensnared by Satan. We should not establish this institution in a city, nor in the suburbs of a city. It should be established in a rural district, where it can be surrounded by land. In the arrangements made for its establishment, the climate must be considered. The institution should be placed where the atmosphere is most conducive to health. This point should be given an important place in our considerations, for wherever the Office of Publication is established, preparation must also be made to fit up a small sanitarium and to establish a small agricultural school. We must, therefore, find a place that has sufficient land for these purposes. We must not settle in a congested center. My brethren, open up the work intelligently. Let every point be carefully and prayerfully considered. After much prayer and frequent consultation together, act in accordance with the best judgment of all. Let each worker sustain the other. Do not fail or become discouraged. Keep your perceptive faculties keen and clear by learning constantly of Christ, the teacher who cannot err. Homes and Institutions in Rural Locations Special light has been given me in regard to moving our publishing houses and sanitariums and schools out of the cities into places more favorable for their work, where those connected with them will not be exposed to all the temptations of city life. Especially should our schools be away from the cities— it is not for the spiritual good of the workers in our institutions for them to be located in the cities, where the temptations of the enemy abound on every hand. The instruction given regarding the removal of the publishing work from Battle Creek to some rural place near Washington, D.C., was clear and distinct, and I earnestly hope that this work may be hastened. Instruction has also been given that the Pacific Press should be moved from Oakland. The move to Mountain View, California, 38 miles south of San Francisco, was made in 1904. As the years have passed by, the city has grown, and it is now necessary to establish the printing plant in some more rural place, where land can be secured for the homes of the employees. Those who are connected with our offices of publication should not be obliged to live in the crowded cities they should have opportunity to obtain homes where they will be able to live without requiring high wages. Think before moving to institutional centers. Those who are necessarily situated near our institutions should be careful how they send out glowing reports of the place. Everywhere there are people who are restless and dissatisfied and who long to go to some place where they think they will do better than in their present surroundings. They think that if they could be given work in connection with some one of our institutions, they would have a better chance to earn a living. Those who are tempted to gather about our institutions should understand that it is skilled workers that are needed, and that heavy burdens fall upon all who are properly related to the work. Those who are connected with our institutions must be producers as well as consumers. To those who desire to change their location and settle near one of our institutions, I would say, 
Do you think that in settling near an institution you will be able to get a living without perplexity or hard work? Have you counseled with the Lord in regard to this matter? Have you evidence that your desire for a change of location is free from selfish motives and would be for the honor of God? Those who feel like settling close to our publishing house or our sanitarium and school at Tacoma Park should take counsel before they move. To those who are looking toward Mountain View as a favorable place in which to live, because the Pacific Press is to be established there, I would say, look to other parts of the world which need the light that you have received in trust. Remember that God has given to every man his work. Choose some locality where you will have opportunity to let your light shine forth amid the moral darkness. Let those who are thinking of settling at Mountain View remember that this is not wisdom unless they are called there to connect with the publishing work. The world is large. Its needs are great. Go, make new centers in places where there is need of light. Do not crowd into one place making the same mistake that has been made in Battle Creek. There are hundreds of places that need the light God has given you. Guiding Principles in Building Operations When plans are laid to erect a building in one place, give careful consideration to other places that are in just as great need of money for the erection of needful buildings. Time is short, and while buildings must be erected, let this be done with due consideration for all parts of the Lord's vineyard. Let the one who has charge of the building be a man of sound, sanctified mind, not one who, in his anxiety to erect a fine piece of architecture, will bring perplexity upon the work by expensive investment. God is not the author of confusion, but of order and progress. Let those who desire to advance his kingdom make haste slowly and build intelligently. Let no one rush on with a stumbling supposition that means must be invested to make a display. Thus saith the Lord, means must not be so expended, for it is at the expense of souls. Never are we to rely upon worldly recognition and rank. Never are we in the establishment of institutions to try to compete with worldly institutions in size or splendor. We shall gain the victory not by erecting massive buildings in rivalry with our enemies, but by cherishing a Christ-like spirit, a spirit of meekness and lowliness. Better far the cross and disappointed hopes with eternal life at last than to live with princes and forfeit heaven. The Savior of mankind was born of humble parentage in a sin-cursed, wicked world. He was brought up in obscurity at Nazareth, a small town in Galilee. He began his work in poverty and without worldly rank. Thus God introduced the gospel in a way altogether different from the way in which many in our day deem it wise to proclaim the same gospel. At the very beginning of the gospel dispensation, he taught his church to rely not on worldly rank and splendor, but on the power of faith and obedience. The favor of God is of greater value than gold and silver. The power of His Spirit is of inestimable worth. Thus saith the Lord, Buildings will give character to my work only when those who erect them follow my instruction in regard to the establishment of institutions. Had those who have managed and sustained the work in the past always been controlled by pure, unselfish principles, there never would have been the selfish gathering of a large share of my means into one or two places. Institutions would have been established in many localities. The seeds of truth, sown in many more fields, would have sprung up and borne fruit to my glory. Righteous Principles versus Imposing Buildings Large buildings can give no Christ-like character to the work, be they ever so imposing correct principles maintained, a righteous character developed by those in Christ's service, firm resistance against evil, these will do more to honor God than the finest buildings. 
large buildings piling up in a few places. Already his judgments have begun to fall upon the inhabitants of the land. He can touch the largest so-called fireproof buildings, and in two or three hours they are as nothingness, burned to the ground. We have before us a great work, the closing work of giving the last warning message to a sinful world. But what have we done in the world? Look, I beg of you, at the many, many places that have never even been entered. Behold the southern field with its millions upon millions of souls. Who is interested in their salvation? Look at the large buildings that have been piled up in a few places. Witness the showing in Battle Creek and in a few other centers of our work. Consider the amount of time, the effort, the means that have been expended in making a great showing in a few places. Look at our brethren and sisters treading over and over the same ground, while around them is a neglected world, lying in wickedness and corruption, a world as yet unwarned. To me this is an awful picture. What appalling indifference we manifest to the needs of a perishing world. Small Plants in the South and Other Places It is not the Lord's plan to centralize largely in any one place. The time has passed when there should be any binding about of the work and confining it to a few places. There are small printing plants to be established and recognized in the South and in other places not yet designated. Publishing Work in Nashville It was in accordance with God's purpose that the publishing work was started in Nashville. In the southern field, there is need of a printing office for the publication of the truth for this time, and especially for printing reading matter suitable for the different classes of people in this field. And there is no city in the South better suited than Nashville for the carrying forward of publishing work. The establishing of such an institution is an advance movement. If rightly managed, this institution will give character to the work in the South and to many souls will be the means of imparting a knowledge of the truth. The Nashville Publishing House will still need to be assisted for a time by gifts and offerings. Sanitarium work also has been begun in Nashville. Slowly but surely, the wheel of providence is turning. We know not how soon our Lord will say, It is done. His coming is drawing nigh. Soon our opportunities for work will be forever past. Only a little while longer shall we be permitted to labor. My brethren, will you not strive with earnest effort to establish memorials for God throughout the southern states? Churches should be raised up. Houses of worship should be built. Small schools and sanitariums should be established. And the publishing interests should be strengthened. The lines of work to be established in different places in the South will need men and women of wisdom and prayer, men and women who will carry the work forward from stage to stage soundly, intelligently, toiling, praying, working economically as laborers of God's appointment. The situation calls for personal, untiring, united effort. One brick upon another, and the highest wall is made. One flake upon another, and the deepest snow is laid. A Place of Access to Black Race As a people, we should take a special interest in the work at Nashville. At the present time, this city is a point of great importance in the southern field. Our brethren selected Nashville as a center for work in the South because the Lord in His wisdom directed them there. It is a favorable place in which to make a beginning. Our workers will find it easier to labor in this city for the colored race than in many other cities of the South. In this city, much interest is taken in the colored people by those not of our faith. In and near the city, are large educational institutions for the colored people. The influence of these institutions has prepared the way for us to make this city a center for our work. Into the institutions of learning at Nashville, the truth is to find entrance. 
there are those in these institutions who are to be reached by the third angel's message. Everything that can be done to interest these teachers and students in the message of present truth should now be done, and it should be done in a wise and understanding manner. From the experienced teachers may be learned precious lessons regarding the best ways of helping the colored people. The truth is also to be brought before those who have given of their means and influence for the benefit of the colored race. They have taken a noble stand for the uplifting of this people. They are to see a representation of our work that will be to them an object lesson. We are to do all we can to remove the prejudice that exists in their minds against our work. If the efforts we put forth are in accordance with God's will, many among them will be convicted and converted. The Lord causes light to shine on the pathway of those who are seeking for light. Light to Shine Forth from Nashville Light will shine upon the workers in Nashville. From this center, light will shine forth in the ministry of the Word, in the publication of books, large and small. We have, as yet, merely touched the southern field with the tips of our fingers. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The same voice that at the beginning said, Let there be light, in these last days declares that a knowledge of God's word shall not be confined merely to a few places. The laborers who have the missionary spirit will go forth as heralds of the morning. Christ, heaven's conqueror, is in the midst of you. From the experiences you are now passing through in the South, all may learn lessons. Truth and righteousness live and will continue to shine amidst the darkness of this degenerate age. My brethren in Nashville, when any attempt is made to divert your minds from the work that the Lord has appointed you to do, let your voices ring out in accents clear and distinct. With unmistakable determination say, I am doing a great work and cannot come down. Why should this work cease, as it would if I were to leave it and come down to you? Never, never, although surrounded by those who desire to quench the last spark of life that God is keeping alive, should you consent to any such proposal. We are not to be under bondage to any man or confederacy of men. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We have followed man's wisdom long enough, and we can avoid the consequences of following this wisdom if we choose to follow the Lord now just now. We need a wisdom greater than the wisdom of man to strengthen the things that remain, that are ready to die. Special Literature for the South Special literature should be prepared expressly for the Southern field. Publishing is to be done in the South to prepare the style of books essential for this field. Talent is being and will continue to be developed that will be the means, through God, of bringing into the truth souls ready to die. Let the Southern Field have its own home-published books. Selected books from the Old and New Testaments can be published in separate volumes with simple explanations and inexpensive illustrations. In addition to these books, there can also be published some illustrated books suitable for school children. These books will be a great help in the work in the South. Solicit Donations from Wealthy Men Nashville is to be made a center for the work. From this place will go forth an influence which will establish the work as the Lord may prepare the way in other places in the South. Let those who labor in the interests of the cause of God lay the necessities of the work in the South before the wealthy men of the world. Do this judiciously. Tell them what you are trying to do. Solicit donations from them. It is God's means which they have, means which should be used in enlightening the world. Warning Against Debt Patient continuance in well-doing, this is to be our motto. We are to put forth persevering effort, advancing step by step, until the race is run, the victory gained. When the publishing work at Nashville was started, 
It was the avowed purpose of the workers to keep out of debt. But in their desperate effort to make brick without straw, our brethren were led to depart from this purpose, and, as the result, the work has become involved in difficulty. But God's workmen at Nashville are not, because of this, to become discouraged. The work must not cease. Let all now seek most earnestly to avoid the mistakes of the past. Let them guard themselves as with a fence of barbed wire against the inclination to go into debt. Let them say firmly, Henceforth we will advance no faster than the Lord shall indicate and the means in hand shall allow, even though the good work has to wait for a while. In beginning in new places, we will labor in narrow quarters rather than involve the Lord's cause in debt. Never amputate a limb that may be saved. On Sunday morning, October 19, 1902, several church leaders met with Ellen White at her Elmshaven home in California to discuss the future of the fledgling publishing plant in the South. After looking at the operating statements and listening to the appeals of the brethren, Ellen White agreed with A.G. Daniels that the Southern Publishing House had better be closed. But the following night, the Lord gave her the vision of the operating room here quoted. That Ellen White recognized that some limbs might have to be amputated even after everything possible had been done to save them seems evident, however, for she wrote in 1898, God help the managers of our schools never to allow the outgo to exceed the income if the school has to be closed. Last night, I seemed to be in the operating room of a large hospital to which people were being brought, and instruments were being prepared to cut off their limbs in a big hurry. One came in who seemed to have authority and said to the physicians, Is it necessary to bring these people into this room? Looking pityingly at the sufferers, he said, Never amputate a limb until everything possible has been done to restore it. Examining the limbs which the physicians had been preparing to cut off, he said, They may be saved. The first work is to use every available means to restore these limbs. What a fearful mistake it would be to amputate a limb that could be saved by patient care. Your conclusions have been too hastily drawn. Put these patients in the best rooms in the hospital and give them the very best of care and treatment. Use every means in your power to save them from going through life in a crippled condition, their usefulness damaged for life. The sufferers were removed to a pleasant room, and faithful helpers cared for them under the speaker's directions, and not a limb had to be sacrificed. A Publishing Work in Mexico I am glad to hear Brother Jones— C. H. Jones, the manager of the Pacific Press for about fifty years, speaking of Mexico, I am sure that God has a work to do in that field. It may be hard to see that much advancement is being made, but as in faith you sow the seeds of truth, you will reap a harvest. It is in God's order that the work should be started in Mexico. Let this work advance." The Lord desires His people to reach out into new fields. When doors are open to us, God wants us to enter at once. Be prepared to improve the opportunity. Branch Office in Mexico In July 1980, the Pacific Press established a branch office in Montemorelos, Mexico. In reference to the establishment of a branch office in Mexico, I cannot see why this work should not be entered upon. I cannot see why, when we are the helping hand of God, when we have been given instruction in regard to the part the publishing work is to act in carrying the message of present truth, this opportunity should not be improved. It is through the publication of our literature that light is to shine forth to many places. Our books and tracts and papers will go where we cannot go. As these messengers are sent on their way, they will give their message. No one can enter into controversy with them, for they cannot answer back. 
they stand as dumb but powerful witnesses for the truth. Publishing Houses in Missionary Lands At various points in missionary lands, publishing houses must be established. To give character to the work, to be centers of effort and influence, to attract the attention of the people, to develop the talents and capabilities of the believers, to unify the new churches, and to second the efforts of the workers, giving them facilities for more ready communication with the churches and more rapid dissemination of the message, all these and many other considerations plead for the establishment of publishing centers in missionary fields. Facilities for Printing at Mission Schools There is much to be done in the way of establishing centers for our work in new fields. Missionary printing offices should be established in many places. In connection with our mission schools, there should be facilities for printing and for training workers in this line. Where there are in training persons of various nationalities, speaking different languages, each should learn to print in his own tongue, also to translate into that tongue from the English. And while he is learning English, he should be teaching his language to such English-speaking students as may need to acquire it. Thus, some of the foreign-born students might defray the expense of their education, and workers might be prepared to give valuable help in missionary enterprises. In many cases, the publishing work will have to be started on a small scale. It will have to contend with many difficulties and to be carried forward with few facilities but none should be discouraged because of this. The world's way is to begin its work with pomp and show and boasting, but all will come to naught. God's way is to make the day of small things the beginning of the triumph of truth and righteousness. For this reason, none need to be elated by a prosperous beginning or cast down by apparent feebleness. God is to His people riches and fullness and power, as they look to the things that are not seen. To follow His direction is to choose the path of safety and true success. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Human power did not establish the work of God, neither can human power destroy it. To those who carry forward His work in face of difficulty and opposition, God will give the constant guidance and guardianship of His holy angels. His work on earth will never cease. The building of His spiritual temple will be carried forward until it shall stand complete, and the headstone shall be brought forth with shoutings, Grace, grace unto it. I have been instructed that wherever by self-sacrifice and urgent efforts facilities for the establishment and advancement of the cause have been provided, and the Lord has prospered the work, those in that place should give of their means to help his servants who have been sent to new fields. Wherever the work has been established on a good foundation, the believers should feel themselves under obligation to help those in need by transferring, even at great sacrifice, a portion or all of the means which in former years was invested in behalf of the work in their locality. Thus the Lord designs that his work shall increase. This is the law of restitution in right lines. Duty of Prosperous Institutions The General Conference has established a program that provides financial assistance for expansion of equipment and facilities of overseas publishing houses unable to meet the demands of a growing business. These overseas houses and the divisions to which they belong are also encouraged to assist financially in expansion programs. All heaven takes an interest, not only in the lands that are nigh and that need our help, but in the lands that are afar off. The heavenly beings are watching and waiting for human agencies to be deeply moved by the needs of their fellow workmen who are in perplexity and trial, in sorrow and distress. When one of the Lord's institutions falls into decay, the more prosperous institutions should work to the utmost of their ability in assisting the crippled institution, that the name of God be not dishonored. 
whenever the managers of God's institutions close their hearts to the necessities of sister institutions and neglect to make every effort possible for their relief, selfishly saying, Let them suffer. God marks their cruelty, and the time will come when they will have to pass through a similar experience of humiliation. But, my brethren, you do not mean to do this. I know that you do not. Every facility we have in Europe for the advancement of the work is needed. Every institution should stand in a healthy, flourishing condition before an ungodly world. Let not the angels of God who are ministering to those that bear the responsibilities see God's workers disheartened. Already the difficulties have increased by our delay, so that the work of restoration will now require greater labor and expense. In the name of the Lord, we ask His people who have means to prove themselves faithful stewards, repair the machinery so essential to carry forward the work of God, that His people shall not become discouraged and His work be left to languish. There is need now of the help that all can bring. Seek to heal the breach that has been made. Do it cheerfully. Do it nobly. Come up to the help of the Lord to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Redeem at once the institution that is in so great peril. Let all who realize the nearness of the Lord's coming act their faith. When we see one of God's instrumentalities languishing, let those who have heart and soul in the work manifest their interest. Let those in responsible positions set a right example. Every noble Christian instinct should lead them to plan and work with far greater earnestness for the relief of the Lord's institution than they would for the saving of their own property. Let all try to do something. Look over your affairs and see what you can do to cooperate with God in this work. Men to whom God has entrusted capabilities and talents of means will be impressed by him to take on the burden of responsibility and help our Scandinavian brethren, in this case the Norwegian publishing house. The cause of God in Europe is not to become a stone of stumbling or a rock of offense to unbelievers. The institutions there are not to be closed or given into the hands of worldlings. Let the Lord's servants in Europe make every effort in their power to recover what has been lost and the Lord will work with them. And I call upon our people in America to cooperate with their brethren in Europe. If all will act their part in His great plan, God's purpose will be accomplished. The difficulty will soon be in the past, no more to harass the cause of God. Sustaining a Smaller Publishing House The following appeal, written November 20, 1900, relates to the financial embarrassment of our publishing work in Christiania, Norway. In 1899, word was received by the Foreign Mission Board that the publishing house at Christiania had become involved in debt and was unable to meet its obligations, and that the institution was in danger of falling into the hands of its creditors. To relieve this embarrassment, financial assistance would be required to the amount of $50,000. This the board could not furnish, and, though our brethren in Norway continued to hold possession of the publishing house for more than a year after this, little was done for their relief. It seemed that the building must finally be given over to the creditors or be sold to raise funds for meeting the debt. Thus, the institution built up by years of labor and sacrifice would be lost to the Lord's work. To prevent this great calamity, The Lord spoke through His servant in the following earnest words of appeal, instruction, and encouragement. Our publishing house in Norway is in peril, and in the name of the Lord I appeal to our people in its behalf. All to whose hearts the cause of present truth is dear are called upon to help at this crisis. Those who love and serve God should feel the deepest interest in all that concerns the glory of His name. Who could see an institution where the truth has been magnified, where the Lord has so often revealed His presence, 
where instruction has been given by the messengers of God, where the truth has been sent forth and publications that have accomplished great good, who could bear to see such an institution pass into the hands of worldlings to be used for common worldly purposes? God would certainly be dishonored if his institution were allowed to fall into decay for want of the money which he has entrusted to his stewards. Should this take place, men would say that it was because the Lord was not able to prevent it. These things mean much to our brethren and sisters in Scandinavia. They will be sorely tried if their facilities are cut off. Let us make an effort to prevent them from falling into depression and discouragement. Let there be a consecrated, united effort to lift the publishing house out of the difficulty into which it has fallen. There are those who have little faith, who may try to discourage others and thus prevent them from taking part in this good work. It needs only a discouraging word to rouse and strengthen selfishness in the soul. Do not listen to those who would tempt you. Wave the questions that will arise as to how the difficulty has come about. It may have been largely the result of mistakes that have been made. But let us not now devote time to criticism and complaint. Criticisms, complaints, and censure will not bring relief to our brethren in their perplexity and distress. God has called human agencies to be laborers together with Him in the work of salvation. He uses men encompassed with infirmities and liable to err. Then let us not censure those who have been so unfortunate as to make mistakes. Let us rather seek to be so transformed by the grace of God as to become compassionate, touched with human woe. This will cause joy in heaven." For in loving our fallen brother as God and Christ love us, we give evidence that we are partakers of Christ's attributes. This is no time to criticize. That which is needed now is genuine sympathy and decided help. We should individually consider the necessities of our brethren. Let every breath devoted to this matter be used in speaking words that shall encourage let every power be employed in actions that shall lift. The Norwegian Publishing House still stands as a testimony to the sacrifices of the Scandinavian members and of the wide financial support of the entire world church that followed this appeal. In 1978, this publishing house was relocated in a beautiful new plant on the outskirts of Oslo. During a recent year, 67,880 books, 350,000 tracts, and 731,400 periodicals were sold at a value of $682,000. A substantial group of full-time coal porters has carried out door-to-door -door evangelism since 1882. All are to be one. The talents to be found among the English and Americans should be united with the talents of those of every other nationality, and each nationality should labor earnestly for every other nationality. There is but one Lord, one faith. Our effort should be to answer Christ's prayer for His disciples, that they should be one. Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. It should be understood that perfect unity among the laborers is necessary to the successful accomplishment of the work of God. In order to preserve peace, all must seek wisdom from the great teacher. Let all be careful how they introduce ambitious propositions that will create dissension. We are to be subject one to another. No man in himself is a complete whole. 
through submission of the mind and will to the Holy Spirit, we are ever to be learners of the great teacher. Study the second chapter of Acts. In the early church, the Spirit of God wrought mightily through those who were harmoniously united. On the day of Pentecost, they were all with one accord in one place. We are to demonstrate to the world that men of every nationality are one in Christ Jesus. Then let us remove every barrier and come into unity in the service of the Master.